Hello and welcome to the Strength and Flexibility Summit presented by Nirvana Strength. I'm Ian McLeod, co-founder and head coach. We'll be speaking with some of the highest level coaches and practitioners in the world to get a better understanding of functional strength and active flexibility. You'll be taking away a wealth of knowledge on some of the most effective and safest ways to improve yourself and take your performance to the next level. On this session, we'll be speaking with Kit Laughlin, the founder of Stretch Therapy and a world authority in stretching and strengthening techniques. He is the author of the best-selling books, Overcome Neck and Back Pain, Stretching and Flexibility, and Stretching and Pregnancy. Kit has presented workshops to many thousands of individuals worldwide. He studied oriental medicine in Chiatsu for three years in Japan and founded the Shoshin Center, where he assists clients to overcome pain related to muscular and skeletal asymmetries. He is a 30 plus year meditator and has taught meditation workshops in Buddhist monasteries in Asia. So without further ado, Kit, how are you doing? Uh, I'm so thank you so much, Ian. It's great to be on and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's great to have you and I really uh, appreciate your time and, and you know, this, uh, you know, this idea that you are a stretching authority. And I think anybody, any of the speakers that are really on here would know of you and would think very highly of you. You have a really good um, reputation in this in this uh, part of the industry or industry as a whole. Um, so I think one of the most basic questions that I think would be very important for most people to kind of get a under, better understanding for is like, why, why do we even need to stretch? Like, what is the what is the point of stretching and flexibility? Because I think there's been a long kind of history of you don't stretch or it's like very minimal compared to the rest of what you do. Um, can we start there? Of course. I just want to clarify one thing though. I don't consider myself an authority in anything, to be honest with you. Um, I, I just, uh, people like, I would also say, I put Emmett, Emmett Lewis in the same book, um, yeah. although he may have a different view on that. The, the fact is we're still, well, I, I learned as much this last year as I did in my first year, which was, you know, 28 or 29 years ago. And so, and also too, you'll, if you talk to him, you, he will talk about open learning systems. So what we mean by an open learning system is simply, instead of protecting the boundaries of the little bit of knowledge that we do have, we actively encourage the crossing of that boundary in both directions. So if, for example, we were working out in your gym and you showed me something that I'd never seen before or something that actually worked better than what I'm teaching now, what I'm teaching now, I would abandon immediately, immediately. No regrets. And I'd say, I learned this from Ian. That's, um, as an ex-academic, that's what we do. We normally attribute our sources, which is pretty rare these days, as you know, but it's very important to us. Um, and in the process of being completely open to other influences, our system has still is still growing at an amazing speed as any learning system will do. When you close your system and start to put your energy into protecting your boundaries, protecting copyright and all those other kinds of things, um, that's when your creativity will, well, the flow normally turns off. And so, and we've, there's plenty of examples of that in our world. Yeah. But anyway, to, to answer your question directly about why should we even stretch, Steve, that's the way to put it. Why should we even stretch? Well, my answer to you would be, you don't need to stretch. It all depends on, on what you want. And certainly stretching is not a religion and, uh, for me, and it's certainly not something that I would recommend to anyone, unless there's a specific problem they want to solve. Let's say, for example, you're an adult guy or female and you're um, training in, in pole dance or, or um, men's gymnastic strength training, for example, it's a, it's a good, good example, a good current example. Um, you won't be able to do a V-sit um, if your hamstrings are too tight. You just won't be able to. So we might have, or you maybe maybe you're a taekwondo player, and their their kicks are head high kicks, and so you have to be able to um, do side splits or close to it, and you need to have that active flexibility. You need to be able to pivot on one leg, as you know yourself, flick that leg out to the side, and return in a balanced position. So part of that is physical control. Part of it is balance. Part of it is a massive part of it is strength, but another part of it is simple range of movement. I've seen yogis, for example, who have excellent side splits, um, perfect side splits, in fact, but if they're ever asked to move their legs quickly, they don't have that training in their body. 
and they they won't be as tight as someone who's a complete beginner, but they will not have that active flexibility because active flexibility is not just a range of movement dimension, although it can be limited by that, but it's also the capacity of that um, agonist muscle to produce the movement with sufficient power and speed and so on for whatever it is that you're doing. So the short answer is you don't need to stretch unless you're doing an activity which has a greater range of movement requirement than what you currently have. And it may only be in a few different directions or a few different planes too. And that's the one you need to work. So that's answer number one. Yeah. Answer, num answer number two though, is a much more subtle thing. And in fact, in my view, much more important thing. And I'm speaking as an ex-athlete myself, I used to be uh, at different times in my life, I was a very keen Olympic lifter. And another time in my life, I was a very keen middle distance runner too. Now those two periods were separated by about 20 years. So lots of adaptation from one state to the other state. Um, but what I found in my own body is that learning how to stretch as in learning how to ask questions of your body uh, in a perfect example might be something like this, supposing I, take my head to the side like this. And I ask myself, how does that feel today? Is that niggling pain that I used to have in this area of my neck or shoulders, is that there or is it not there? Mm. And, and if it is there, then you can, then you'll know exactly what position to put yourself into, what little movements to do, what mobility techniques or what contract relax or other techniques you need to employ to lose or to get rid of that tension in that area. And that tension could be yesterday's workout. It could be a fight with your girlfriend. Um, it could be just the pressure of COVID-19, a whole bunch of different things. But as a human being, when we experience stress, stress of any kind, emotional and physical, the body's response, I'm not talking about the corticosteroid response now, which is what everyone writes about when they talk about the fight or flight response, the direct response in the body when you're stressed is an increase of tension everywhere. And the parts, let's say we're talking about this bit that I was speaking about a moment ago, the parts that were pre-stressed reach a tension holding level where they actually signal pain to you. I mean, you know, if you were designing the world, you'd make it so that if anyone's under stress, it'd be the unstressed muscles that actually lift up their tension towards the stressed ones and we'd all be beautiful and balanced. But that's not actually what happens. The whole of the tension as patterns in the body, patterns created by your activities and your age and your lifestyle and so on and so forth, all of the tension increases and some parts signal pain. So for that reason, for an athlete or for an ordinary person, an average person who wants to be comfortable in his or her body, learning to stretch and it's not about getting extra range of movement it is only about trying to find out how this part or that part or the whole body feels today so would that would that be the standard then as far as like what is enough uh, range of movement for a let's say quote unquote normal person is like that that feeling of comfort in your body on a day-to-day -day basis and and also to the capacity to resist but the technical term is perturbation. And perturbation means when you poke something or push something or disturb a system, a complex system, do you move it from its current position or does it just do this little movement, process that inside and then resume its normal state? You want to be the latter, you want to be, you want to be stress resistant. And I think, well, let's take a step back and, and look at this from an evolutionary perspective. The reason why human beings are such effective killers, and that's we have to we have to look at our species and see what they've been doing over the last hundred thousand years. And any student of history comes to the conclusion that humans are best at killing other humans. That's what we do best, and also not just other humans, but all sorts of other species on the planet too. That's what we're best at. And the reason we're so good at it, and the reason why we're allegedly the the top, we occupy the top slot on the food tree or whatever it's called. With the, with the apex predator, I think is the correct term. The reason for that is that our forebears had this most amazing and rapid capacity to mobilize the fight or flight response. Mm. And we have simply used our intelligence to use that to do whatever it is that we're concerned to do. And as a result, we're in the position that we're in today. But, but And that's a sympathetic nervous system response, as you know. But today, survival in the era of COVID-19 and all the other things that have happened and the era of the Donald too, although not for too much longer, in the era of the Donald, um, the capacity to mobilize the relaxation response, in my opinion, for the individual 
is at least as important as the capacity to mobilize the fight or flight response. And what that means to, do, to really relax and to be experienced deep relaxation, um, you have to be able to stimulate all of the opposite reactions that are governed by what, what we call loosely the parasympathetic nervous system. And so whereas the fight or flight response ramps up everything, dumps adrenaline in the bloodstream, uh, cuts off blood flow from the internal organs. That's why you know you, you have a hard time digesting something if you get a fright. So that you've got all this blood and nutrients and glucose and so on to be able to run or fight or all the other F words. Um, but on the other hand, if you want to if you want to calm all of those things down, and this is why we also recommend doing stretching exercises at the end of a workout, not at the beginning of a workout, because stretching or or stretch, stretching the physical muscles lowers the resting muscle tonus in the system and the whole system experiences that as ah i'm relaxed yeah and so it's, it's a perfect balance to dynamic powerful activities and that's another reason to consider a, a small routine after your workout whatever that is so when we're thinking about like stretching and flexibility and, and the, like the relationship it has with our body you know we obviously a lot of us are not professionals in this field or not specialists so we listen to you know therapists and practitioners and researchers but what are some of the kind of conflicts that we see between those uh, individuals and maybe what are some of like the basic like misunderstandings that you feel like people have with regard to stretching okay look that that's a very good question and it actually opens up a huge can of worms here because Although I said I'm not an authority in this area and I don't consider myself to be, nonetheless, I'm fully on top of the literature in all the different fields. Um, and also, too, I know many of the top practitioners in different fields, too, just like you do. <coughs> we have a wonderful opportunity in our work, especially through forums like this, to be able to share that information much more rapidly than would have been able to pre-internet, for example. Anyway, a little digression. Um, one of the views that was very prevalent in the men's gymnastics strength training world, and there are all sorts of reasons for this historically, and we're talking recent history here, last five years or so, is there is a school of thought that says adults who want to do or want to get, acquire the flexibility that the gymnast displays, adults need to train the same way that young gymnasts train. That is to say, and I remember a famous coach saying that all of the flexibility and mobility elements that are required for the later skills are all contained in the mobility aspects of that work. But, and that is true for young gymnasts. And, and Ian, that's something that, that is there's not an obvious thing, but most dancers and most gymnasts start, and my wife is a, an ex-competitive gymnast. She started stretching when she was six years of age and she was considered rather late as, as a stretcher. And so by the time she was 13, 14, 15, she had extremely good flexibility in some ways, but she would tell you, if, if you ever would like to interview her, she's a, a different spin on this stuff again, even though she's the co-owner of the company and we both teach and we both write and both present things. Um, when she ended her gymnastics career, that's actually where we met at university. And she had incredible tension in some parts of her body. For example, from all the jumping and sticking landings that she did, her calf muscles, there was no flexibility in her ankle joints at all. And when she walked around the house, it was like a little elephant, you know, dunk, 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 dunk. Um, and that was something that she took away from our work. It was immensely useful to her because she realized that she'd never actually stretched those parts of her body before, not once. And so in the gymnastics world and in the pole world too, to some extent, and, and definitely in the dance world, there's this view um, that, the, that the same methods that do definitely work with children, and that you don't even need particularly good form, you just need to practice these um, drills as they call them regularly. Dancers go to limber classes every day before they do their dance school, for example, and it's extended warm up stretch, we'd call it. If you're not flexible, it would look like they're stretching because they're all sitting in front splits or side splits and then complaining about how stiff they are and sore they are that day. And of course, that's not our experience trying to get into those positions. It, ours is a different experience. And so I realized very early in my stretching experience that uh, what works for children and young adults just does not work for adults with bodies like yours or bodies like mine, where through many choices made in our own personal histories, we have developed or made our bodies into the thing that walks and talks today. And what you find as an adult when you start to stretch for whatever reason, 
there is massive resistance to change in the beginning. And this is completely unlike strength training or aerobic training, where, as you know yourself, any beginner on any program will make progress, right? Up until they reach a plateau of some sort. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about lifting weights or, or getting fitter. You just have to run a bit further each day or every second day or however often you're training. And in the gym, you need to lift heavier things on a regular basis and you will get stronger. But in the beginning, when you start to stretch, you experience that same strength as resistance to elongation. And the body and the emotional response to this can be very strong. I've seen people get so frustrated with themselves because they're doing that what they think are the right things. They've been told by their coaches or trainers to stretch like this and do this and do that half a dozen times or whatever. And they can feel in their own bodies that doing those half a dozen repetitions of whatever it is hasn't changed anything. Yeah. And they have exactly the same resistance in their body. And they're saying to themselves, look, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing the work, but nothing's happening. So there's a couple of things to say on that. And the most important thing to say is just to reiterate the business about the, the greatest resistance you'll ever experience in your body is in the beginning when you start, unlike the other disciplines we were talking about. And the other, and, and the other thing is to become flexible for many people, especially if you're relatively heavily muscled or you come from an aerobic background where you're used to short uh, range of movement activities, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. um, it's going to take you years to become flexible. And no one wants to hear that. And in fact, I've heard people say, oh, your, your system your systems is just not efficient enough. And I, I uh, saw on YouTube last week, this guy was advertising that I could get down in cyclists in four weeks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, I, and I said, look, what's that? Sorry. The light on Instagram, you see the guy is like, not flexible and then he's like fully flexible and it's like oh four weeks 30 minutes a day and it's like you're going to get these results well um i'll just say good luck to anyone who believes that they're going to be able to achieve that and i should say look to be completely fair if you're an exceptional um and way off the scale of normality human being and you have loose joints and uh, you know your experience your life is relaxed and blah 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 it's quite possible that you can get uh, flexible quite quickly but we never promise that to people you'll discover that by yourself whether you're in that select group or not very quickly but for the average person and I consider myself in the flexibility um, sense to be well, well under average actually when I started stretching there were literally no parts of my body that were in any way flexible I know I've told this story many times but it's true after interval training one day at the Sydney University um, number one oval I was bending over trying to touch my toes and my fingers were just past my knees, you know, and my back was bent like this and it just looked absolutely awful. Someone took a photograph of that while I was desperately trying to get, you know, get past my knees. Um, and they put it up on the gym wall and some, someone wrote rubber man underneath it. And, you know, I have to say that was really the beginning of my stretching journey because I looked at that and this is how dumb we are. I mean, I consider myself to be really dumb in lots of ways. You look at that and you think, well, I know I'm stronger than the average runner. I'm certainly um, elite fitness in terms of cardiovascular fitness, resting pulse rate of 42 hours there at one point and so on and so forth. But look, I can't reach my fingers past my knees. Do you think that might have something to do with, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Do you think that might have something to do um, with all the pain that I'm experiencing in my middle back, especially when I try to finish a race um, or when I wake up in the morning, I feel like a truck rolled over me over the, during the night. And when I take those first tentative half dozen steps in the morning after getting out of bed, I'm literally walking like someone's on hot coals. Anybody who runs competitively, will, that's what their life will be like. I think it's tough for, it's tough for people to kind of connect the dots, you know, and, and the same for me, you know, I coming from American football background, bigger, stronger, faster. I, I totally understand what you mean by like, not being able to get the fingers even past the knees. Um, but, you know, like we think about stretching and nowadays we hear a lot of, you know, words like uh, like fascia or doing or mobilizing the joints when it comes to like getting better flexibility. And, and I think it's 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 only common or it's only normal that we as humans try to find the, the shortest possible path to oh, yes. our, greatest, uh, our greatest goal, right? And um, but when it comes to stretching, you talked obviously a little bit about how it's already a little bit different than gaining strength and gaining um, aerobic capacity. Why does that mentality not necessarily work with, uh, with stretching? 
because the the resistance that you're encountering when you try to stretch something that resistance is actually you you yeah. ian mcleod the personality the um the way you look at the world how you relate to people how you see yourself all of those kinds of characteristics of human beings which as far as we know animals don't have anywhere near as much so it might sound like a might sound like i'm drawing a long bow here but let me try and explain what i mean well let me take it in a roundabout kind of a way the hamstring stretch, let's say you're trying to touch your toes. The hamstring stretch that everyone thinks of is the archetypal toe touching test. Or yeah. if you're a runner, they'll put a foot up on the wall or something. Um, and you'll see these absolutely rigidly stiff people trying to move towards the leg and nothing's happening. And, and the reason is that the protective mechanism in your body is, is maximally active when that knee joint is straight, if you're talking about the hamstrings. But we have a, an exercise free on YouTube. We have got a couple of hundred clips up there, I think. Um, it's called the elephant walk, which is a bent leg forward bend. Mm -hmm. And what people find is, of course, as soon as they bend their knees, all of a sudden the hip joint bend beautifully and they can put their chest or their ribs on their thighs, right? You can imagine you bend over, knees are bent. There's no tension in the hamstrings at all, hardly. And then what you do, instead of trying to move a straight body towards a straight leg, you in fact invoke something that's called the reciprocal inhibition reflex. You use your, the quadriceps on one leg to try to straighten the knee joint a bit while you hold your body on the leg and then let it relax immediately. And then you do the other leg. You try to straighten the knee joint, but still keeping the body on the leg. And then as soon as you feel strong tension, you let it go. And so when you do straighten, tension, relax, straighten tension relax from side to side the whole body sways from side to side like an elephant walking and we have seen people literally improve their toe touching test six inches in a single workout so when i say a single workout i'm not talking about an hour of gut busting stretching i'm talking about one single run through the exercise here we might be talking about two minutes of relaxed completely unpainful stretching and so here's a dimension to it that is not obvious, is that we, we, our group and other groups too, who work like us, have discovered all sorts of things that were never written about in Paul Anderson's original book, Stretching, or, or Alter's book, The Science for Stretching. Those exercises that I'm talking about, these partial to complete movements are not found anywhere except in our work, as far as I know. Um, and what that does is it, it immediately shows the brain that the tension being produced by the body, which at its heart is a protective reflex. Let me just talk about that for a bit and I'll come back to that point. The reason, if, if you've ever injured a part of your body and, you know, hands up anyone who's listening who hasn't injured something in their body, of course, everyone has. The first thing you notice is that the muscles around that area shorten. They shorten to protect that area. They shorten to, it's called splinting technically, just like a, you know, putting a piece of wood on a broken bone. The muscles around an injury splint that area so that it can't be moved in the next 48 hours easily or so, something like that. And so when you come back, you asked me before whether it's fascia or muscles or joints or whatever, you know, the different perspectives on stretching. We cannot generalize about it what it is in any individual's body that is holding them back. Yes, we can ask them, we can interrogate them and say, look, when you get yourself in this position and you try doing that and you pull something else, what do you feel? Sometimes what they tell us they feel can provide a clue. So for example, my partner, Olivia, her fascia in her middle and upper back was incredibly tight. And so on a workshop one day, this is how we find these things out too, by the way, it's always completely accidental. It's never deliberate. You know, you don't sit down there with a calculator and a slide rule on a computer and work out how we're going to improve how we approach flexibility. This is what happened. She's sitting on the floor trying to do a pike, a seated pike. She's yeah. trying to put a face on her shins and she's got the right proportion. She probably could um, do that head to toe thing too, if she were loose enough to do it. Anyway, so that's the sort of thing we're talking about. But when she bent forward, she only got her body to about 45 degrees. And I said, well, I know you're looser than that because, you know, you're sitting inside just a couple of minutes ago. What is stopping you from going further? And she said, I feel this incredible tension in my calf muscles. 
Now we knew her calf muscles were tight, but she did actually develop something which she and her training partner called sledgehammer stretching, which we'll talk about later, because it's a great name, isn't it? Sledgehammer stretching. Come on, man, I want some of that. That sounds like it'll do the job quickly. And it certainly did for her with her calf muscles. But anyway, this is the key thing. Leaning forward in that position, she felt sensation in her calf muscles and the end of the hamstrings on the top, just past the knee. But I knew that her hamstrings were really flexible. This is the thing. And so I thought, I wonder what this could be. So I walked over to her and she was wearing one of those bra tops so that the skin on her body would bear. And it was summer. And I just, just like this, I went over to her and I just felt the skin like this. I just moved the skin sideways and up and down. And it was absolutely rigid. It, that layer of skin, the superficial fascial layer had was completely adhered to the muscles underneath directly underneath and so i just did and this again only took 30 seconds i'm not making this up we've got a video on it too i think on youtube as well yeah. but i just went across her back like this in such a way i could probably show you on my arm where i was moving the skin mm. to separate the skin and there was real resistance there but you do it three or four times and the next thing you know then when you do it lightly it moves easily and I did the whole of her back sideways and also up and down. But honestly, 30, 45 seconds maybe tops. And she immediately put her face on her shin. Uh, again, I'm not exaggerating that. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and to kind of go along with that thought, you know, I do find even when I'm doing like skin fold measurements on people and you have a certain level of like toxicity in the body where the essentially the layers of the body kind of, it, it heats, it, like they're almost like stuck together, like glued together. And that capacity, like, you can't really, obviously, like, you can't, like, stretch your muscles if the skin is really attached to everything. No. So, totally uh, very important point, because, and this was only discovered recently, um, when I did anatomy and physiology, fascia was described as inert ground substance, and some textbooks still say that. <laughs> yeah. it's, any, it, it's anything but inert. It has all four nerve endings in it, the Pacini and the Ruffini and all the other ones also proprioceptors as well, mechanoreceptors, the, the tissue, this uh, allegedly inert tissue is absolutely as fully alive as any of the other parts of the body. And here's the, here's the, the key thing in, all of that is joined to the brain. If when you're trying to do a movement, your brain senses, um, I'm going past my normal range of movement in the fascia, or I'm going past my normal range of movement in the muscle, or I'm going past my normal range of movement in a tendon in the, in the case of um, dynamic work with calf muscles and so on, the brain says stop. It's that same protective mechanism. So the task, here's the thing, this is the guts of, of what I want to talk about today. The core idea of our work is not to stretch muscles. Mm. We are stretching, we're using uh, the, the, the bones and the muscles and the fascia and the ligaments and the tendons of the body merely as ways of contacting a part of the brain called the somatosensory cortex. Yeah. We are showing the somatosensory cortex through the proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors that the movement outside the normal range, which is where the protective reflex cuts in, that movement is both comfortable and safe. And as soon as you do that, and we might, we might have used eight or 10 different techniques in order to get to that new part of the range of movement. And you do it in a particular way, you let your whole body go soft, the breathing is incredibly important. You do contractions if that's indicated as well. And then once you've done your breathing and you've let the whole body go soft, especially your tummy, and you try to move a bit more deeply into the position and you get a bit of a new range of movement, you stay there and you relax and you breathe for at least half a dozen breaths. And you cut, this is also very important. You come out of the stretch slowly back into your normal range of movement. That's the point at which the brain realizes, holy moly, I stepped off the cliff, I didn't fall. And yeah. then when you go, I'm sorry, one last thing. And then when you go, and we see this on workshops all the time, you go and stretch that same range of movement, say five minutes later, you go past that point at which your body was protesting as though it had never been there. Yeah. That's how much the mind is lying to you all the time. And it's not through malice or um, trying to, you know, make things difficult for you. It is simply the map of your range of movement is only what you have done in the recent 
and middle past. That's all. Yeah, no, I, yeah I totally agree. And, and like, I think going back to really quickly that example you gave with the elephant um, dread exercise. And I, for me, the big takeaway is like the, the typical way that most people think about stretching where they basically get forced down into, so they basically have some like external uh, pressure being placed on them versus uh, actively like and intentionally moving through it, like more of an intrinsic engagement of the, of the muscles. In, in, in fact, it's a, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, yes, we do, but we do use weighted stretching, of course. We, I mean, that's yeah. part of the system. Having said that, um, when you want to try to go past one of your own actual barriers, if you can provoke the movement into that end position using the antagonist group of muscles, which is our preference, mm -hmm. perfect example would be trying to use your hip flexors and your abs, for example, to try and do a pike. That's a perfect example. Now you can look, we have partner versions of the pike, we have contraction versions of the pike, we have dynamic versions of the pike, all those other versions. But if you want that capacity to gently pull yourself down, not using your arms on your feet, rather, using the internal muscles of the body to pull yourself down onto your legs. And that, that is what everyone wants after all, because when you're doing a V up or any other movements, you have to move your own legs. You can't use your arms to move your leg, right? So if you want real range of movement, you have to be able to, at, at some point, eventually, you have to be able to provoke it yourself. What we found is that the ranges of movement that you can explore using your own muscles that range, new range of movement stays with you longer than any of the other techniques, even though we might use some of those other techniques to get past that initial barrier. Yeah, and, and I think you now the other one that I really liked was uh, how you talked about getting out of the position is probably even more important than actually getting into it. It is. And I think it happens a lot with people where they'll get into a position and while they're there, they have no capacity to be uh, to relax or stay calm. They're basically like they created more tension while they're in that in position. And then as soon as you say like, all right, everybody out of position, they just right spring out of it. And, and I think that's the that's the typical reaction of someone who's one like and you're basically teaching the mind that that position is not a safe place to be. In fact, in fact, in fact, Ian, if you actually if you if you're cool enough to to ask yourself what am i actually feeling right now mm. as you're in that position what the body's experiencing is panic yeah yeah and panic is the antithesis of relaxation now look we need uh, i think a lot of people have misunderstood this idea they think what i'm advocating is um basically just the development of relaxation skills and that's all that's nothing could be further from the truth um, it's absolutely, if you want to be able to generate force, and let's face it, in all of our activities, and looking at your body, clearly you, you have a body that can generate force. If you want to generate force, then you're going to have to push against heavy things or lift heavy things. There's no way about it, no way around that. And you're going to have to exert an immense amount of effort, at least momentarily. Mm. But here's the thing. If you want to become flexible, look, if that, if that worked, I would have been perfectly flexible, honestly, 30 years ago. But it doesn't work. And so having found that that doesn't work, forcing things and holding things against incredible internal resistance and all the rest of it, finding that that doesn't actually do what you want to do, then I and a bunch of other people, we kept asking ourselves, well, okay, if that doesn't work, we've got to try something else, try something else, try something else. And so what we teach today and what we write about and what our programs are about are all of those techniques. Mm. I mean, what you call the secrets, I've written an article on uh, my forums and the access to the forums is free. And it's, it's the greatest um, repository probably of information on stretching and mobility and available in the world right now in terms of discussions about those things. Um, we found that, well, to, to speak most generally, I was gonna say, I was just gonna refer your uh, listeners and to, to, to the forums because they're free we don't charge anything for those and they're moderated as well and, and that it, the level of discussion there is very polite and um, not overly polite but it's like the kind we say just pretend that you're the discussions you're having on the forum are like you have a couple of friends over for a drink on a Saturday afternoon um, and you're talking about something and it's just that just civilized you know uh, very anti-Donald Donald is not civilized in my opinion anyway he I know, I know I've probably talked about him too much and his days are numbered, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so what, what we found in our work, and again, this is a bit novel, what we found is that 
for Olivia, the skits of the illustrator perfectly, I personally need to experience extremely intense sensations and relatively briefly, and then I repeat them and they become my range of movement. Once I've experienced them intensely, then I find I can relax in that position. But, but we, because we have to be able to generate force in all the activities that we do, we have to have this capacity to switch it on and then instantly switch it off when we no longer need it. And that's where people are lacking in our culture. They do not know how to switch it off, if I can put it that way. Sure. So we can, we can teach them how to do that. And stretching is a very effective way of doing that. But what I was going to say was that uh, Olivia, on the other hand, those intense short duration things where you might be mobilizing all of the different reflexes that we talk about, they're not effective for her. Now, isn't that interesting? Mm. Um, what's effective for her is holding a position at an extended range of movement, but not so, so extended that she's experiencing it as intense in any way letting herself relax, and then she does what she calls micro movements, borrowing them from Robert Schleip's wife. And she has found, she has got hip flexors that are as loose as mine, but she has never done all of the, or hadn't done as much of the super intense. I have a training partner, I had a training partner with 120 kilograms, and he'd be on my back leg, and he'd be holding my calf muscle, and I'd be trying to pull my leg through his grip as hard as I could. I mean, literally as hard as I could. And every muscle in the body was involved in this. Yeah. But she doesn't need that. And so this is the, the key take home here is this, until you try the different techniques, you won't know what your body needs. And it's not a case either, Ian, of once you know your technique, then that's all you do. Because what you'll find, in fact, is the hamstrings respond to one recipe but the quadriceps or your shoulders or neck might respond to a different recipe. And we're talking about the same body here. The task is to find out what your body needs to be able to explore the range of movement and not experience it as something that makes you panic or that hurts. And so I think like one of the things that I take away from your two experiences is, and it's something that I think it's easy for some people to kind of confuse particularly if they're already naturally very flexible, uh, is the capacity to relax or do you actually not have any um, muscular connection, right? Like, do you, can you actually engage the muscles? Can you uh, purposefully engage and relax the muscles or? Oh, sorry, no, no, wait, wait, no, you, you've misunderstood me. Um, we, what, when I say relax, I, there are actually two different steps in the process. This is really important, what you've just identified. Yes, of course, to get into a stretch position, you have to be able to let the muscles that are being stretched relax, right, to some extent. But when you get to the end position, if you're doing a maximum hamstring stretch or a maximum adductor stretch, that'll be intense. Sure. That will be experienced as intense, and we actually want that intensity. But then... In the face of that intensity, through previous experience and previous training, we then say to ourselves, okay, I'm not going to move. I take a breath in. As I breathe out, I let my tummy go completely soft. Now, if you're experiencing a super intense stretch, it'll be very hard to let your tummy go soft. So you might need to back off a millimeter from that point until, and when, when I take tummy go soft, I mean, if someone had come over and press into your tummy, can you let it move away from their fingers? Now, most people hold their trunks quite tight most of the time. That's what we mean by protective tension. It's unnecessary as you're sitting there talking to me on the, you know, in our part of the world, but a long way away. I'm no threat to you. But nonetheless, when we're engaging with another human being, there's always some level of tension there. And this can be varied from a small amount to a huge amount, depending on the circumstance. Tension is good, but we need to be able to let go of it when it's no longer needed or necessary. And so in the instance of stretching, once we experience that intensity, which absolutely makes a sensory connection to that part, we use these tricks and little techniques to let everything go soft while holding that position. And what you find once you're able to do it, and people can't do it in the beginning because they have no experience of it. But when you do learn how to do it, what you find is there's an experience in the muscle that it just literally lets go. Yeah. And you don't move. You don't immediately then go into the, a deeper stretch. That's that will not help you either, because all you do is re-experience the that panic tension again. No, you stay there, stay there, and if you can, little movements. 
and then you come out of it and you go back into it again, but not anticipating the intensity or the tension of the pain. And what you find is just again, like before, that point at which you stop before, you'll be past that point. It's a, it's a trick because look, here's what we're doing. When you're using the form of the stretches and the muscles and ligaments and tension to work on this part of the brain so that it knows the position which it doesn't know from past experience is not dangerous. That's what we're doing. That's the whole of what we're doing. So you do find uh, a lot of a lot of benefit from the having the capacity to perform movements at close to that in range position. Yes, and and, I think and and we also think that that affects the fascial system more. Now we can't say for sure because again it depends on the person. Um, Olivia, in, with that example that I described, where she was trying to do a seated pike, she already was doing movements in that position, but the adhesions between her fascia or her skin and, and the muscles were of such an order that that the little movements weren't enough to loosen it in fact the movement that she needed to do was this kind of a movement a hunching over bending movement in that position which she didn't think to do on that occasion which she's since done since then not because of this thing about it we're in a pike we're trying to bring the, the body close to the legs with a straight back right that's the idea, right? And everyone thinks that if you have a kind of rubber band theory of muscles and ligaments and joints and so on, you think, okay, the only muscles that are lengthening between here and here are the hamstrings and the and the gastrocnemius, let's say. That, but the model's wrong. The model that we're operating in terms of our understanding of these phenomena is simply wrong. Yeah. It can be, it can, well, let me, let me explain. It, it, if, for example, you bend forward, and you feel a bit of a tingling in the toes, or you find that as you bend your trunk forward, the toes point, which is typical of someone that's done dance or gymnastics training, then what the limit there, if you try and pull your toes back and all you feel is a tingling in the toes or massive restriction at the hip joint from pulling your toes back, that's because your neural system is not slippery enough to allow that additional dorsiflexion of the ankle. And just putting that traction force on the nerves causes that this pain and discomfort. And so we have, particular techniques which are designed to make the nerves be able to move in their sheaths a bit more freely and you don't need much more movement. So that's, you might say that's an example of, of a, a restriction being more neural than fascial. But on, on another occasion, it might be, you, you might have seen that uh, fascial release we do for people who are doing the legs apart pose where they're trying to put their chest on the ground. If we do a fascial release between gracilis and the inner hamstring, because if you don't have that range of movement, those muscles are actually stuck along their length from the part that's below the knee up to about a third of the way up. They're actually stuck there. And because of where this muscle attaches and where this one attaches, they need to lengthen at different rates to do that pose. And if you're the kind of person in the legs apart pose where you just feel a massive sensation like a electrical or a, a, a wire that's been pulled too tight or a hot wire that goes across the inside of the knee, that's gracilis in the inner hamstring. And what you're experiencing is those fascial adhesions between those two muscles. Now, a beginner will not be able to distinguish that sensation from, I can't move in this position. It's really uncomfortable. It hurts the inside of my legs. So we've got ways of loosening those sorts of things too. So there are muscular restrictions. Whatever you can produce a force with a contraction and go further afterwards, that's neuromuscular. That's the the neural system and the muscles, not the, so much the fascia and not the, nerve, the neural system on its own. If you get tingling sensations, that's more like the neural system and you need to do some, what they call it nerve flossing now, there's a whole bunch of different techniques that are used. And if it's fascia, you need to do something else. So that's if, a short. Yeah, so if we were to, let's say, if you, do you have any like basic uh, like principles or a way of thinking about like the different kinds of stretching techniques or like let's say if, if I wanted to go out and find like what is the best technique or best thing for me like is there a, a particular way of thinking about the techniques relative to my body that will yes. help me find a better a better uh, fit yes there yes but this is what people don't like to hear the next bit is what people don't like to hear yeah um, until you try some stretching technique, and it doesn't matter what you begin with, until you try some stretching technique and you really ask your body, I'm in this position here, what does that feel like? That's question one. Mm. Then question two is, how can I, how can, what do I need to do for that feeling to change so that I can move a bit deeper into the stretch? 
So, the, and also what, what, uh, what power am I going to use to move deeper into the stretch? Am I going to use my own arms? Am I going to use weights? Am I going to use, say, the hip flexors if we're still talking about the pike? Um, the only way to find out which of those things is going to be most effective for you is to try them all. And so in our mastery program, for example, uh, in, an, in one of the programs is called Master the Pike, and I think it has 22 or 23, five to seven, some a bit longer programs in it. And so what we recommend, and it is a lengthy process, I agree with this. Look, the short story is if, if we knew the secret, the one secret to stretching that everyone needed to do and it would be effective for everyone, that's what we'd be teaching. Mm. It'd be a lot easier than what we do now, I can tell you, a lot easier. The answer though, the real answer, if I'm being honest, is each of us needs to find what, which of those elements are going to be most effective for this part of the body. And the only way you can do that is to play with it, to experiment with it. You have to, you have to know, it's like a recipe book. You've got the, you have to know which of the elements to use. You have to know how to use the element. You have to then actually experiment with it and ask yourself, how do I feel both in the moment of having done the stretch, but then in the next two or three days, because I, I assure you the first time you stretch your hamstring properly, and get a new range of movement, you'll have the most hellish doms um, and your hamstrings will be sore for a week. I'm sure you've experienced this. Uh, but, but you can only get that experience once. And so what you do after that is you'll find that your flexibility will change. And the next time you go to stretch, providing you don't stretch while you're still sore, you must give the body time to recover. And I think that's where most uh, really enthusiastic young males in particular go wrong. They, they think they have to stretch every day. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't stretch every day. There are times when I have stretched every day to do something, some particular thing, or I've got some particular thing that I want to do, or, or I'm testing someone else's protocols and they say you need to stretch every day. But in my own body, I have found that if I want to do hard hamstring stretching once or twice a week, but a proper session on hamstring is all I need. The hamstrings will be sore for a day or two afterwards, but, the, but once they've overcompensated, when I go to stretch them again, they feel different. It, the, it's all about the feeling, Ian, and you won't find the, fe the feeling dimension in a sets and reps approach. It's yeah. just not there. And I've, uh, I've, yeah, I totally agree with you with regards to like, well, for, my, for myself as well, like I, I've limited myself to two, two times a week, maybe even maximum like three times a week. Uh, I do remember like some sessions where it took me a full 10 days to fully recover from um, a particular hard uh, lower yeah. body uh, flexibility session. And, yeah. uh, but I, but I do find that, I mean, I think some people experience it too with regards to programming with like, let's say strength where they finish their eight or 12 week program and they don't see the, the massive prog like gain until after they've rested for one or two or three weeks. Yes. Absolutely. And there's another dimension to this too. We are not, and this goes for strength as well as flexibility. I understand completely what you mean, but supposing you've, um, you've been on a heavy back squat session um, and then you do have a week off at the end of it, when you go back, back into the gym again, man, you feel, feel like Superman, right? But there's another dimension to the stretching part of it, which is not obvious. And that is there, for, especially for people who are really tight, you'll be doing the work and nothing seems to be happening. Yeah. And you'll be saying, should I've been doing this for three months, this program's no good, um, blah, blah, blah. And that's not the case at all. But one day they're in, they're sitting there in the gym and they reach down and, they, the next, and they're playing with their toes or they're adjusting their toes or spreading them apart or something. And, and I say, oh, look, that's interesting. You couldn't touch your toes two months ago. And now look, you're actually sitting there playing with your toes. And I've had guys say, fuck, I had no idea. I, I just, it doesn't feel any different to me. And this yeah. is accurate. Mm -hmm. That's men, more for men than women in, in that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think we're uh, pretty much out of time now. Um, well, look, I, I'd be very happy if, if you do get any feedback and people would like to talk more and, and maybe even just, I think I'd be does. happy to. For me, I find it very interesting. And I think that, I mean, obviously even like each one of the, initial questions that we like even talked about like that in itself can be its own um you know yes. long long discussion because i think yes. there's definitely a lot of and there's like even some questions with regards to like re research and incorporating different techniques and yes things that would be quite interesting to get into uh, maybe at a further date 
But well, I um, would I, I would love to, Ian, if, if you would like to. Uh, yeah, I would love to as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, where uh, where would be a good place for everyone to kind of uh, get a uh, to find you and to maybe get a better understanding of? Oh, the okay. That... So I'll, I'll give you three places. Yeah. <laughs> They're all available from our website. Uh, one, the website called stretchtherapy.net. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, you can go straight to what we call our, the wiki. And we have audio files. We have podcasts like these. We have relaxation, audio recordings, some of which are recorded in mm -hmm. monasteries in Asia when I was teaching there. And these are all free. We try to, we, we have charge, we have pay programs as well. But, but all the accessory ancillary material we try to make free so that someone who doesn't have the money can use the free stuff on YouTube plus the relaxation exercises plus uh, become a member of the forums and ask a question there and someone will answer them. If, if someone is motivated, it's not going to cost them a penny to do the work. Yeah. On the other hand, if you want, if you want, uh, for example, our mastery program, which is the big three poses, full back bend, uh, legs apart, and of course in time side splits and also pike and then Front splits. Um, those programs are available, uh, and we have a a long email sequence that goes with them that exposes them to things like, for example, here's how we suggest you start with this material, do that for a certain number of weeks, and then try adding this, and then try adding that. And and of course, people can write to us. We've had these the forums are just goldmine because someone will say, look, I tried this, but I felt this really strange pain on the outside. I of my knee, not the inside of my knee where you said we might feel I found on the outside, what can I do to change that and to move past that? And someone on the forum will have had that experience and they'll just make a suggestion. Yeah. It's okay. it's a great resource. It's great for sure. Yeah. So yeah, I think stretchtherapy.net is where I would start. Um, and the, the other person whose work I recommend, and it's a bit odd because no one in our business ever recommends another coach, but but um, Emmett Lewis, Emmett Lewis is more on the performance um, circus end of the stretching world. And so if you're a, a pole dancer or you're someone who really is interested in refining your front splits or your side splits, and you have five or 10 years of experience in your body, then in my view, you just can't go past Emmett's work. Emmett's a practitioner himself, just like I am. Um, and we, we, we do and can do the things we talk about and teach. I think that's that's pretty important. You have to have some kind of faith in the beginning where, especially because the resistance, as I said, in the beginning is so high, you have to work with someone that you have at least a, a, a certain amount of trust for um, and and who's who's saying, yeah, you need to do this for you know two or three months before you're actually gonna find out whether this is gonna work for you in this particular instance. You actually gotta do that work to find it out. You can't just read about it on the forums or, or yeah. uh, I see people and you, you, the comments on YouTube are, inc are incredible. People say, I've been doing this for two weeks now, and, you know, no change. I'm thinking, yeah, okay. Anyway, you, you get the point. People have to be a bit patient too. So they have to have a bit of faith in the beginning and you have to be patient too with yourself. Yeah, I think that's- Because if, if I can put it this way, it's not the resistance in my body, which yeah. is stopping you from doing a full pike. Mm. It's the resistance in your body. It's the most personal thing you'll ever experience. That's what that's what we're up against. Yeah, I think it's tough, you know, and, uh, and I think even beyond, you know, the, the physical training of, of, of flexibility, but like its relationship to other types of training modalities and also just our general relationship with our environment and our, and our surroundings, right? I talked with uh, Yudi uh, Marmerstein about the the limiting beliefs that we come from, our, oh, yeah. our environment, like how much that affects. And I, I think yes. that even another topic that we could even go into. Oh, uh, I, I would love to. I know Yuri very well. You might have noticed he made a few. He comes out and stays with us for a, a week or two every year. Mm. And I've done his workshops and he's done my workshops. And he, incidentally, Yuri has the best cold flexibility of any human being I've ever come across. Uh, in, in addition to Ryan Hurst, you know Ryan Hurst, don't you? Yeah. Cold mental body. Well, Ryan Hurst also has amazing cold flexibility. Just yeah. breathtaking. Mind you, he's been a he's been a gymnast since he was about four, I think. But that's not the point. He can teach adults how to become flexible, and Yuri also can, but through a different mechanism. Yuri was a couch potato, as you know, for many years, and then he decided to become, you know, the handstand guru. I mean, it happened a bit slower than that. But the point is that Yuri had no instruction on flexibility from anyone. All the things that he teaches, mm -hmm. he found himself and he can demonstrate. He made them work. 
Yeah, and I think that's a great, uh, um, a great practitioner to find is someone who's actually like gone, gone physically, like gone through all the process. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Someone, so, who's nat someone who's naturally flexible and, and it's a super bendy and they can demonstrate this, that and the other position. And when you say, but I can't put my body into that position, look at where I am now. How do I get from here to there? Well, we can help you do that. We can, we're the how to get from here to there people. And no one, no, not, not, not even Yuri or Ryan have, have contortion level flexibility, but they have exceptional flexibility and it's available cold. No warming up necessary. We're deep believers, and we like, as we like to say in workshops, cats, when the neighbor's dog jumps over the back fence, a cat never raises its little claw and says, excuse me, I have to stretch my hamstring. No, they, they just go from asleep to full power. Yeah. That, that's what we want. Mm. It's possible. It is possible. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate having this conversation with you and I look forward to future conversations as well. For those of you that want to tune into the sessions that we also did with uh, Emmett Lewis and, uh, and Yudi Marmerstein, uh, those are also gonna be available on this summit as well. I uh, hope you're able to take away a lot of uh, knowledge and wisdom that you can start applying to your own practice and hopefully you can reach out to uh, Kit and, and get a better idea of of some of these kind of uh, topics that we've been discussing in a little bit more detail. So until the next uh, session, stay strong and keep training hard.